Yes, Thank man. You. Dale Thompson. Yes. How are you? Good. How's your day going? Good. Good morning. Yeah. It's it's early for you. You're in New Zealand. Yeah, it's uh one seventeen. Okay. That's yeah. That's a heck of a time difference from here. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. How was your Good Friday? <laughs> Did you uh do anything special? Do you go out on Good Friday or stay home? Mm, no. No, I uh went to the grocery store. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cuz uh because today is actually, is today Friday or Saturday? For you, it's Saturday, I think. Yep. Oh, uh, yeah. So that was yesterday. No, I stayed home for Good Friday yesterday. So. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, hey, man. Well, thank you for uh, agreeing to be on Good Company, my yeah. podcast. <laughs> this yeah. is great. I grew up watching you um, or listening to you. So this is an honor. And I'm representing tonight. See, I got my. Oh, I saw that right away. Yeah. yeah. I can't believe that. I don't, I don't even have one of those. It smells like uh, it smells like if I uh, like maybe a grandmother's attic right now because it's been in storage. So yeah, that's uh, that's a lot of dedication to, to be wearing yeah, it. You. Uh, yeah, yeah. You might could, wash it and it may may just you know disappear <laughs> on you too. So it's uh, yeah, it could could shrink. Yeah. yeah. Well, today I've been listening to the new Bride album, Eyes Wide Open. It is so good. I love it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That uh, that's the um um uh. EP. So. It's more of an EP. Yeah, I should clarify that. Um, yeah, the uh, the LP will be out next month. So it'll, it's got 12 songs on it. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I get confused sometimes with the LP and the EP. So Yeah, what, what happens is that um, th- this album has, has been recorded for a very long time. I mean, mm. a year and a half, probably. And um, it took us a while to get it, get it mixed and get it back. Then we we uh, worked out uh, uh, a mutual deal with uh, Retroactive, <clears throat> and um, they wanted a marketing campaign of pushing the EP first. So uh, I thought the I thought the EP was going to come out a couple of months earlier than it did, but it it probably is coming out exactly at the right time because I don't know what other um, albums other people are or putting out and and I put out so many albums myself that I don't want to compete with one of my own projects. So <laughs> right. I don't know of anything coming out next month that I've done other than the bride album. So how did you uh, get involved with uh, retroactive records? Um, did they find you or you find them? I've known, uh, I've known uh, uh, Matt hunt for a number of years, probably maybe, I don't know. It goes way back 25, 30 years, probably. Um, I mean, he's actually been to Troy's house and, and stuff. So uh, nobody ever comes to my house, but they'll go to Troy's for some reason. But anyway, <laughs> it's probably because of the dogs. But anyway, um, and now the distance. But um, uh, we've known him forever, it seems like. And then when he was just starting up, um, I, I don't I don't have the best memory on things. But I just know that we were without a record label and we really didn't care if we had a record label. And uh, Matt approached us and said, hey, I've, I've sort of got a vision for you guys. And um, although some of my other projects that I do are with, you know, Rocks or Girder or somebody like that, uh, we we have stayed uh, loyal to to uh, Matt with the uh, the bride material. <clears throat> oh, that's good. Yeah. So he, he does this real well. He gets the albums out there. People seems seem most of the time to know the album is available. It's not like it was in the old days where an album came out and everybody knew about it because there was a write-up in CCM magazine or Heaven's Metal magazine or, you know, we were represented at a a festival. Uh, Not anything to that degree anymore. I mean, we think the internet would be a much better platform, but uh, the internet has kept Bride alive. There's no doubt about it. I have nothing bad to say about Facebook uh, whatsoever because with the bad, there's the good. And it's, and for, for me as an artist, it's only done good. Right. Uh, the only thing bad about Facebook is I get myself in trouble. So the less I say <laughs> sometimes the better, uh, <clears throat> but yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, Matt's, Matt's been uh, like that fifth, uh, fifth beetle for a long time. So did, did Matt help you guys, you know, I don't know if Matt or if it was your guys' decision to, when you released this EP, was it hard picking these four songs that were going to go first ahead of the LP or? Um, I didn't, I didn't try to sway Matt 
one, one way or the other. Uh, I feel uh, I feel pretty confident that he has his finger on the pulse of things and that he 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 would have received some feedback from one person or the other. And, um, you know, and, and I think he picked the tunes that probably flowed best with the new songs. Yeah, that that first song, I guess it's the first song you released, Make Me Want to Live Again. That isn't, uh, I love that song. I can't stop. I mean, I, I play it over and over again. It's so good. Well, Great. it's 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 a really a good song. Uh, I don't think it's the best song on the album. And I'm glad he didn't release one of the other couple that I like better. Mm. Because uh, if I figured if people liked uh, Make You Want to Live, uh, they're really going to like the rest of the album. There's no, there's no, uh, filler songs on the album whatsoever we made sure that we mm. we tossed wow. anything that that we thought was not bride worthy it's got to it's got to reach a certain plateau now to be bride worthy and oh. if it's not we we toss it so when you say toss it you do you write do you guys write a lot of songs and then pick the best or do you just write just enough to to make the album no or, we trim, we write yeah. we do write extra songs um what happens is is that troy will um something will spark in him and he'll let me know and he'll say i'm writing the bride album now because he and i together are doing a lot of other stuff as you probably know some of it uh with uh the uh classic cover songs that we do almost oh, weekly yes. yeah it's cool. and uh yeah and we we have a new one of those coming out in the next couple of days too it's it's going to be a, a surprise for everybody but troy troy does this is he starts writing the bride songs and then he sort of gets in the zone and he sends me the music here. And from there, uh, if I already have lyrics written, I attempt to use those lyrics uh, to see if they fit, see if it's, it's the right, uh, you know, climate, atmosphere, landscape for the song, whatever. And uh, if not, then I will write a song according to that, uh, I'll write the lyrics and then uh, record those lyrics, send them back to Troy, see what he thinks about it. And sometimes he'll say, you know, um, the chorus needs to have more of a hook. It's not, it's, it's not memorable enough. Mm. Or what if you rephrase this or that? And, you know, then we sort of bounce it back and forth. And, and if I hear something for him, like, you know, um, you know, why are we starting with a chorus? It would be better to start with the verse. Then he'll flip that around. So Troy and I have this amazing work, working relationship and always have, we never argue. We never disagree. Oh, wow. We respect one another a hundred percent. So if Troy tells me something's not working, mm. it's not working. And if I tell him, I hear something in my head, he understands that he, he, you know, needs to do some rearranging. So it's, it's definitely a team effort. It's there's not either one of us is more equal than the, the other and or higher above the other one in the band. We work, uh, you know, very cohesive and, yeah. uh, and, and have always done that to the chagrin of some band members who just, you know, we tried to work with certain guys and it just, you know, we, it, it was like pulling teeth sometimes, you know how it is when you, you're trying to yeah. write with somebody and they either have too many ideas or they're way <laughs> off in another world. Troy and I as brothers, we seem to be on the same page 99% of the time. No, yeah. that's, that's a great point. Do you ever, I got kind of two questions. Do you ever run out of things to write about? And do you write for other people? Uh, I do I mean, write for other people. I, I, I've, I've been recording on about 16 to 18 different projects, not just albums, wow. projects for the last few years. I've written over a thousand songs in the last 36 months. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. So I, I keep writing, you know, I've got bands like uh, Iron 501, um, the Thomas Thompson Earth Project, Perpetual Paranoia, uh, We Are Res We Are Resolute, uh, The World Will Burn, uh, Swingle and Thompson Ordained. I mean, I could just keep wow. naming bands, you know. Uh, so I write for all of those bands, and I, I probably put out five or six albums a year, and The Reconciled, which um, the first album that that Todd Stevens and I did is is a remarkable album, and I think it did get overlooked a bit because it's not thrash metal or or super duper heavy it's it's more just a really great hard rock album yeah uh and that's definitely one for people to to listen to but um 
Yeah, I think that uh, what was the first part of your question? No, well, the first part was, do you ever <clears throat> um, do you ever get kind of writer's block with so much? Material? Oh, yeah, a writer. Um, well, to tell you the truth, I recently have had a little writer's block. I used to have a folder with I keep about an average of 200 lyrics and completed lyrics in the folder. And oddly enough, because I recorded so much, I've either dissected those apart to where they're no longer usable because I've used pieces of it in other songs, or I've just used the entire uh, lyric and uh, it's gone, you know. So now my uh, my vault is very empty and I also write short stories. So a lot of times I end up writing so much in my short stories that I'm not writing lyrics no more like I used to. I used to write lyrics every day. Now I'm writing short stories every day because oh, I'm actually wow. getting paid for the short stories. So that's so that's a, a cool thing for me is that I'm a published author in writing short stories. So. What are these stories about, by, by the way, these short stories? They're, um, I started off trying to just write mystery stuff, and then it turned into horror, and now it's like horror, mystery combined. Uh, with always a twist at the end of the uh, the story, and they're being uh, published and read through uh, uh, scary tales told at, at, at dark on uh, Otis Jerry's podcast, uh, okay. and he's got a couple million subscribers, so it's really cool. Like this weekend, he's reading four of my stories on his podcast, and the, sto oh, the stories wow. are about five thousand, six thousand words. So, you know, thirty, forty minutes each read and it takes people from point A to point B, no gore, no profanity, no uh, sexual content. It's just spooky, eerie, setting the scene, you know, kind of like paranormal stuff and all that. So when growing up, um, you know, before music, I guess when you were in school, did you write a lot? I mean, was this, you sound like, like a super smart <sighs> student, you know, I don't know. That's cool. Uh, I, I did write a lot. I uh, I started writing uh, short stories, actually, when I was about five years old. And uh, probably the first songs that I wrote, I was probably 12. Uh, so I started writing songs about 12 years old because wow. by then I could, I could actually make chords and follow chord patterns. And, you know, I never I never intended to be a uh, solo lead guitar player or anything. I just played the basic chords and tried to come up with melodies. But at that time, I was doing more, uh, more Southern gospel and very light contemporary Dallas Holmes and Praise, uh, uh, Rusty, is it Rusty Goodman, Don Francisco type stuff at the time. So uh, then it somehow it, it trans transgressed, as some people will say, but it's, it um, <clears throat> transformed into whatever it is I'm doing today. <clears throat> what, what 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 music were you into growing up? What were your influences? band wise the know. the early the early influences uh were, were were christian artists like the imperials and petra and uh i've always listened to to christian music um and then in the secular realm i guess uh, i mean very early on it was it was john denver and kenny rogers and bob seger and uh stuff people like that and it yeah. wasn't until 1980 when i heard the seeds of change album by carrie Livgren that uh, it changed my perspective on on what I should be doing. It That album really spoke to me like no other album. So <clears throat> I wasn't a wasn't necessarily a big Can <clears throat> Kansas fan at the time, but I did go out and buy some Kansas albums, not knowing that Ronnie James Dio was not the singer of Kansas. <laughs> and uh, so once I educated myself that the greatest vocal on Carrie Livgren's album was Ronnie James Dio, uh, I uh, went out and bought some uh, Dio stuff. Uh, I s tried to stay away from the Black Sabbath stuff early on mm -hmm. uh, because I'd heard so much about it and all this, you know, ooh, it's super evil and stuff. So as a young Christian, I, I was uh, listening to, uh, not a young Christian, but just being young and being Christian. Um, so I, I, did, I was influenced by Ronnie James Dio a great deal uh, in, my, in my, my rock style. And later on, of course, I, I did I did study Black Sabbath and Rainbow and some oh, of the yes. other bands, and then you know learned about guys like Ian Gillen and uh, you know some of my favorite guys like that, and the Bruce Dickinsons and <clears throat> you know Rob Halfords and people like that. And mm. you know, oddly enough, I never I never oddly enough uh, I never really studied Axl Rose and had, really didn't have a great appreciation for Axl Rose until just a few years ago. 
uh, and that's to be honest, um, people thought that I, I sounded like him or he sounded like me, but um, the, the, the inspiration or the styles that I was going for back when I was getting that Axl Rose comparison was I was listening to a lot of Aerosmith and Mother Love Bone and oh, wow. bands like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. And I was listening to bands like that and, and, and Soundgarden, but uh, I had a hard time with Axel's voice. So when people said that I, I sounded like him, it, they were complimenting me, but I wasn't taking it too much as a compliment <laughs> because uh, I didn't, at the time I didn't, I didn't appreciate what Axel was doing, but now I look back and I'm like, Oh my gosh, you know, the guy could yeah. really sing his butt uh -huh. off and uh, he, he was fantastic. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I was more into the songs than I was him at the time. Oh, okay. You know, the, they were kind of yeah. message and yeah, I get Yeah. That. The cool grooves. And it seemed, it seemed like it was real life stuff. It wasn't some sort of just poetry thrown on the page. Like a lot of stuff I do sometimes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, they, they, they had lived, they had lived it and they sang about it. So that I respected them for that. <clears throat> you, you, um, you're such a great front man. I remember seeing you, you know, in, in the nineties, how do you how do you become a front man? And, and you know, I've seen you play in front of, you know, Brazil and all these fans and everything. Is that just come natural? You're like you're just leading the crowd. You're you know, you're in charge. I don't I don't like I don't like to be in a room with a lot of people. As a matter wow. of fact, anybody that knows me knows that I don't have people over and I don't go to their house. And we sort of like two ships that pass in the night. Mm. Uh, I have a live pretty private me and my wife, my, my two dogs. And uh, uh, so even, even, you know, uh, get together, get togethers I'm uncomfortable with. And I guess because I don't have any control over what, what really is happening. So I feel like, I feel like I'm a, I'm a fifth wheel out there. Um, so I don't know why I'm so much like that. Uh, I like the idea of friends, but I'd like to keep them at arm's length, so to speak, Yeah, you know, and yeah. I've got some very good friends, but I, I think that being on stage, I, it just gives you the opportunity to do something that you're, that's not really you. <laughs> mm. uh, people think that that guy on stage is me, but that's that guy on stage is not me. It's um, it's a, a, a character that I've created. Um, Dale Thompson on stage is not Dale Thompson in real life. Nothing. Mm nothing is the same uh you know i'm i'm just <clears throat> not the same guy but when they say ladies and gentlemen here's bride and boom i hit the stage and that that character i turn into that character and that character does does what he's supposed to do or what he's expected to do because the only reason you're on that stage is because people have come to see you so you want to give them what they've come to see so wow that's that's incredible how do you how do you get in the headset to put yourself in that character. I mean, is this, do you get nervous? Do you have to build up to this thing? I mean, never get nervous. Don't think about it. I've been backstage before and it, right in the middle of just a conversation, leaning against the pole and heard it was, you know, we were announced and somebody says, you need to go out there. I'm like, Oh, already. And I'll just go, but I never get nervous. Wow, even when I sang, that's amazing. Even when I sang for Striper, I, uh, I uh, didn't have to get my, my, my mind in that space to do it. Uh, I mainly tried to stay away from Janice because she was trying to put makeup on me to go out. So I was trying to hide from her. So I kind of, <laughs> kind of hid backstage where nobody could see me. And I was, and I, I'm sure they were like, well, "Where's Dale at? We'll start. He, I know he's here." You know, uh, so I put on Michael's clothes, and he's coming out dressed as Michael, which I borrowed Michael's shirt or something. Oh, you're wearing a shirt? That's funny. Yeah, I think I was wearing a shirt. <laughs> and uh, and anyway, uh, they announced that I came out at that time, but I didn't. Because they were all back there getting dolled up, because that was what you do in that day. And I had already, I'd already been through that phase and, and wasn't going to put any eyeliner on. So, so <laughs> yeah. I, I, I that come out just me. <laughs> that that that's funny. That's a good point you brought up that you played in Striper. A lot of people don't know you. You you guys did a show, right? It was in the ninety one, ninety two ish, somewhere around. Yeah, there. we uh, yeah, Brad had just toured with Striper, and and Striper is known for doing these long tours like like they're doing now. Cause I just, I just hooked up with the boys here in New Zealand a few weeks ago. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it, it's quite cool because that was huge for Brad to tour with Striper. You know, we were their yeah. opening act and Striper liked us so well that they allowed us to come back out for encores. 
So I knew that, wow, that's cool. You know, Brian's getting an encore at a striper show. And I didn't think much about it. And then uh, Robert pulled me to the side near the end. And he said, uh, Mike's, Mike's leaving us. And I, he didn't give me any detail. I didn't get any, any real detail. I, I think uh, from what I understood is that, that he just, he just felt like he should be doing something different than Striper at the time. I don't know if that's what, what, what it was. I never, I never foreseen myself as a long-term replacement because you can't replace Michael and Striper, Michael and Robert, or Striper, basically. I mean, Oz too, yes. you know. But 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 even if Oz were to were to leave, they it would be Michael and it's like Brian, you know. So, yeah, yeah, I was just gonna say that. Troy yeah. Now. yeah, exactly. So um, so anyway, yeah, uh, I did. I think it was two sets in one night or something, something like that. And yeah, so it was it was somewhat short lived, but but we really uh, used it to slingshot Brad at that time. And um, I remember Cornerstone, the record label Star Song, did up a newspaper. And it basically the he headlines were, is Dale leaving Bride for Striper? And they handed out like 5,000 of these newspapers to float around Cornerstone that year. And so everybody was reading it. And people that really didn't know who I was or, or, or followed Bride, but were huge Striper fans, wanted to know, well, who was this guy that, you know, was worthy to step into to Mike's shoes? Hmm. But... I, I just thought it was just a fantastic experience. Uh, I stayed with Robert out there in, in California and uh, he, uh, man, he was such a cool guy to hang with. And then since then, Oz and I have become much better friends. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I saw him the other night. Got to meet Perry I saw that. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Th yeah. I was being, a, I was being, a, I, I was Dale Thompson, the rock star that night. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I put on my rock star face and I just you went should. around like a maniac. So Th I said, that, yeah, awesome. I might not be able to ever do it again. I might as well do it here at the Striper show. Yeah. Oh so, yeah. So we, I, we talked to fans. It was great. So. I was like, was so ready for you to go on stage and do a song with them. I was just waiting, you know, I was like, I was, killer. I was, I was hoping deep down, but not expecting it. I was yep. kind of hoping to say, we have somebody here tonight. Might want to come oh, to the hell yeah. with the devil with us because, uh, I was going to rip that song. I was, I yeah. had it already in my head, you know, I was, <laughs> was going to go up there and just, just let it fly. And I think somebody asked Mike, and Mike's like, "Well, you know, we haven't rehearsed anything or any." Anything oh, like okay. That. But yeah, I very seldom rehearse anything these days, so it doesn't matter to me. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> you know, if I if I don't know the song, I just scream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you wrote a you wrote a book. Uh, it was kind of an online book, right? It wasn't a print. But I remember reading something on your website. Can you talk about that? I mean, it, it is it's, it still it's out still there? On the, yeah, it's still on the broad, uh, broadpub.com uh, site, and it only goes up to the Absolute Records days with Des Dickerson and okay. um, and the Fistful of Bees album. And that is basically from my perspective only. I do think that I allowed either Scott Hall or Steve Osborne, maybe Scott Hall, to write a little piece in there to amend something that I said that he didn't agree with, and I was fine with it. Um but after after Absolute Records, we we've never written on it again. And I think to if we were to finish the book, Troy and I would actually have to sit down and write it together because I don't have the same memories as he does. If he shows me a picture, I can remember things. But if he if he's talking about it, it brings up memories, and then we can discuss it. And it it, it would be cool if we had somebody to to get us both together for a few days and finish the book out. But mm -hmm. uh, I don't foresee that happening uh, anytime soon. Yeah, it was a great, it was a great read. And I don't, I don't like to read. I like to listen to audio. So it was, that, uh, but you know, I was thinking <laughs> as you were saying that, I was thinking how cool it'd be if you guys had a podcast where you tell stories like that, you know, that would be so cool. Yeah. It would, yeah. Because if I get on, if I get on live stuff by myself, I ramble. So <laughs> okay. Troy would have to do it to keep me, to keep me, um, uh, you know, on in the subject that we're talking about. So yeah, that would be kind of cool. Um and, and it and it's there's a likelihood of it because I am I am planning on coming back to the States where we're in the process now of filling out the paperwork and and um doing doing all the things that you have to do to sell a house and, and move to back to another country. So oh okay. Um this um great you mentioned greater I'm, I think I'm pronouncing that right. They re-released your albums. 
On, oh, uh, Girder, Girder, Girder Records? Girder, I'm yeah. sorry. Girder. Yeah, I got them right here. Uh, yeah. I love that they're doing this. This is so cool. So I'm, I'm assuming they just, uh, you guys got together and decided to release these. This is amazing for the fans. Uh, we weren't really, uh, we weren't really, uh, what, what am I going to say? Uh, we weren't part of that. They, they just released them. Oh, okay. Okay. How, how, do, how do you <laughs> feel about that? I mean, were you, were you glad they were released or? I mean, I'm not glad they're released, but, but I'm not getting paid for them. Yeah, that's terrible. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of that out there right now. There's a lot of uh, a lot of bands that have albums floating around that nobody's nobody's paying them for. If I bring a new band to a record label, they'll they'll pay me what you call a finder's fee. Mm -hmm. But because uh, the market has shrank so much, record companies are no longer buying your albums and supporting the band as such. Uh, they're wanting you to give them the album, and then they'll give you some product. And then from there, uh, you're pretty much on your own. So there's no labels really doing that where they're where it used to be in the old days. You were part of the label. Yes. This these these are all one album deals. You want the album? Oh, great! You're going to give me a couple hundred bucks for it. Sure, I'll take it. It's better than nothing. Oh, you know? okay. yeah. And um, yeah, so and, and some of them will let you keep your digital digital royalties. But I think that's the least they can do because, you know, if they want a band to continue, they're going to have to they're going to have to support the bands. And that's why so many bands do one album and, and they're they're done with it. I've got projects now that haven't been released because they they can't get the support uh, yeah. that they need. And the market's flooded. There's too, too many bands right now. I don't think the bands are being policed the way that they should to, to see. I think they're just putting them out because somebody's recorded something. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's, it's and it's not it's, it's not always good for the market, you know, because you're giving you're giving the consumer too much to think about. You know, I used to love the fact that I waited for an album. I didn't buy an yes. album for a few weeks, and yeah. finally I got that album. Now there's a new album every day, every day, you know. And, and I mean, and look who's talking. I'm the guy that's throwing out albums left and right, but I'm trying to only do the quality quality uh, work. When somebody approaches me, I've I've actually had to say no to a few people just because I just didn't think they were where they needed to be. They needed to improve before I put my name associated with it. But the bands that I have been associated with, I really believe in, um, you know, uh, I think that, uh, that these guys are writing some good music, that, you know, at least in, in the camp and in that circle that I'm in. Mm. Um, it, what's um, I kind of want to talk about a couple of records that, were huge influence on me and that's kinetic faith that oh that yeah do you ever go back and listen to these albums uh very seldom um i uh, i don't listen to a lot of music now mainly it's like background music like if i'm writing and i've got some sort of ambient thing on uh, that i'm listening to in the background it has yeah no no vocals so it can't influence me writing lyrics um, but no, I know that Kinetic Faith was was a powerful album, and that album would have never came to uh -huh. be. But Des Dickerson and Mike Kyle from uh, Star Song Records came to see us play a showcase for them in Louisville, uh, Kentucky, and uh, they were so impressed. They said, "Well, let's do let's do two songs. We'll do Everybody Knows My Name, and we'll do Same Old Center, and we'll put them on." An, an album and we'll just see how it goes. Cause they weren't, they didn't want to commit because they didn't have a band like us and didn't know what might, might be, you know, what it might be. Yeah. Uh, I think Des saw something in us because he come from that era, you know, he was in Prince and, and all that. He worked with Prince. Oh, and that's cool. So he, yeah. So he, he was Prince's guitar player. So he, uh, he uh, saw something in us and, um, that the, those two singles did so well, like 15 weeks at number one and stuff like that, that they had to do something, you know, they couldn't let us go at that point. Uh, so they, we signed a three record deal with them to do uh, the kinetic fate, the snakes in the playground. But when it came to Scarecrow Messiah, we didn't like what star song was doing uh, as a company. So we talked to John and Dino and they flew us to California and we recorded uh, Scarecrow Messiah out there. 
And pretty much they told Star Song, we've got Bride's next album right here. But you don't get it unless you do whatever. I don't even know what they said, but we'll give you the album. Oh, the whole hostage. Yeah, or you can either have them do another album and they're out of their contract, we're releasing this one. So I don't know what the deal was. I wasn't yeah. involved in that. I just was glad somebody was on our side because I just felt like the label was going one way and telling us one thing and we were anticipating much more and it never came. And then when John and Dino stepped in, it was like, hey, you know, these guys are our best, you know, our two new best friends. Uh, they they care about what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Um so anyway, that that's that's the way those three albums came. It seems like we do albums in threes. So <laughs> we'll see, see what happens uh, after this one's released. Um, so you know, Snakes in the Playground was set, like for me that was such a a huge album for me. Um, did you guys know in the following you know Connect Faith? Did you guys know you had like a really good album? Like, how'd you feel about Snakes in the Playground? We felt like we were the best band going at the time in any field. Uh, we felt like we could hold our own against anybody live. And if we could capture that live vibe in the studio, uh, we actually captured more of the live vibe in on kinetic faith, I think, but the mix dumbed it down a little. Um, we weren't happy with the mix on kinetic faith at first, but the more we, we got used to it, I realized Steve Griffith yeah, who produced it. If I think if he'd have been more forthright on how he was going to do it, we wouldn't have been offended by his mix, his initial mix. Mm. But we went, we went with that mix and the more it grew on us, I was like, you know, Steve might just be a genius. But then when, <laughs> when Plinky came along, I know sometimes it takes me forever to catch on. And when no. Plinky came along and produced snakes. Um, he, he brought up the rawness that, that we, uh, that we we felt like we were, and there was so much energy on that album that, you know, throwing in two ballads didn't slow up the the momentum of this of the album at all. So that we knew that was going to be a good album, and that was a hard fault album too because we recorded in a studio in Nashville that parts kept breaking down. We oh, had to wow. have a tech in. Yeah, there was a lot of stuff going on uh, in the studio. Uh, you know, between the tension and the you know, recording and, and just being exhausted. And, you know, I would sing like eight hours, you know, wow. and the worst, worst thing you want to hear from a producer is, man, that was fantastic, Dale. Uh, but I think you got one more in you. I think you got, I think you got a better one again. Let's, let's hit that again. It's like, hmm. are you out of your mind? <laughs> <laughs> do you ever lose your voice? I mean, I mean, do you ever burn out like that in, in the studio? No, no, I never, never have. The only time I've ever, I've lost my voice twice. Uh, once it was in Brazil at the end of a tour. And I think that was basically stress because we literally went to Hades and back on that tour. And that was the last show and we were dead to the world. And somewhere in North Carolina or South Carolina somewhere, I just had to apologize and say, you know, guys, I'm, I'm shot. I can't do it. And then I found out I had a lacerated vocal cord and uh, mm-hmm. they, they wanted to, to do surgery on me at that point. So instead of doing surgery, I just prayed a lot and I went into fistful of bees uh, with no voice. So that that's why there's no big screams on fistful of bees is because uh, my, I had a lacerated vocal cord. So I had major damage in there. And since oh, then, I've wow, damaged a- it worse. Yeah. But I've learned how to I've learned, learned how to work it since I've. I've never had it repaired. So. Wow, I've never knew that. Yeah, so it's slowly, yeah. slowly got back. Yeah, um, when you were yeah. doing, when you guys were doing snakes in the playground, did you have all the stuff written written uh, before you guys hit the studio, or were you writing and recording at the same time? We had everything pre-produced except the song "Goodbye," which we wrote in the studio. Hmm. Okay. Troy had the melody on the piano, and I and I had lyrics, and so I wrote this. I wrote the lyrics there. And uh, Planky, who was a better piano player at the time than Troy, said, well, let me play the piano oh, and I'll cool. play the piano on it. And uh, that's, how it, that's how it came about. So oh, he played the piano. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. How, if, how long... if my memory serves right. I'm pretty sure it was Planky who played piano. Yeah. <laughs> did, did you guys tour that record to death? I mean, I'm, I think I saw you guys on that tour, but was that a we, long run? We 
Yeah, well, we did, but I think we did snake. We did scarecrow not too long after that. Really, I know that with with snakes in the playground. You know, we went to Brazil, we went to Europe, Scandinavia, up through Canada and stuff. And um, I I think with scarecrow we did some Scandinavian and and Germany stuff, but slowly the the market started changing. Uh, Something something dreadful happened, which is called uh, praise and worship. (laughs) <laughs> and and uh, all these youth pastors that were involved in bringing bands like Bride and Baron Cross and Guardian and all these bands out to do shows, they decided to set up their own stages, create their own bands and buy their own light like, show and their fog machines and call it Youth Church. And so uh, next thing you know, um, heavy metal bands were a thing of the past and um uh, you just had a lot of these contemporary artists coming in and, and doing the shows, but I blame the decline of Christian hard rock, heavy metal on youth pastors along. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, that That's interesting because, you know, a lot of, a lot of people always talk about grunge destroying the, the that, that kind of scene, the hard rock, I'm not calling you guys the 80s scene or anything like that, but interesting enough that, that, that kind of style of music uh, affected you, what you guys were doing as well. So what do you think yeah, about it, the grunge? It, Did that have an effect on you as well? The, you know, the whole Nirvana thing coming out? Um, well, Seattle had an effect on everybody, whether they, they admit it or not. Uh, it definitely did. It went from the tones of your guitar to the people changing the melodies. I mean, to, to not change at that time when bands like Nirvana and Pearl Jam were so big mm. uh, and they, they, just, they swept away everything, you know. I mean, you had to change some. Bands like Metallica didn't have to change because they were heavy metal, heavy metal all the time. And then they changed almost to their demise. Uh, bands like Brad wasn't heavy enough not to change. So we had to do something to be relevant. And that's why we did the Jesus Experience. I thought the Jesus Experience yeah, was that, a good that's... representation of mm-hmm. both rock and grunge sort of combined together. You know, the worm was definitely 100% you know, Nirvana, that's, that's what we were going for. Yeah. Uh, I want to go back to the Scarecrow Messiah. I, I'm such a geek. I printed it out in frame. Uh, uh, I don't even have one of those. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, this is, yeah. <laughs> I wish this was on vinyl and I wish you got paid for it. If it was on vinyl, the, yeah. the, I love the album cover though. And speaking like, how did you guys pick this album cover? Now I'm assuming that you fronting. The yeah. Band. Yeah. And most people don't even see that. So they, I didn't see, see that when I was, when I was yeah. younger. Yeah. Yeah, they're like, what is that? I was like, it's me. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah. Uh, uh, Tony Thigpen from uh, Star Song, I think, created that. I think so. Created that. Uh, and and I think I just sent him a picture. Uh, and I thought they would have put a collage or something like that together. And she come up with that. And we, he said, ah, that works for us. So. Yeah, I yeah. I love this album, um, and I remember reading in your book, you're like, weren't there pressures to follow up Snakes in the Playground? Oh, there was massive, and there still is to this day. Everything that we do, people will say, uh, uh, a good, you guys did a good album, but Snakes is still my favorite. Guys, you know, how come not a Snakes too? I said, I've done Snakes too. It's called Scarecrow Messiah. Oh, that, you know, I and, love Scarecrow Messiah. I mean, that, that album's amazing too. I think yeah, and then I, and then we did uh, This Is It, which is my favorite product. I love and, that album. Yeah, I'm sorry. And I Keep said, and I said, that's that's snakes. That's snakes too. Yes. There's another snakes too, and people just didn't get it. And I'll tell you why: because they were in a different place than they were when they heard snakes. For some reason, when snakes mm-hmm. came out, people, the majority of the hard rock fans of this this genre, they all seemed to be in a place that it connected with them. And then I think they may have moved on, but we didn't. We come out with Snakes 2 on Scarecrow Messiah. And by then, I think I think maybe they weren't so much over it, but they 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 didn't know. I don't think people really knew what Snakes 2 was supposed to sound like. I mean, what, just redo all the songs again? I mean, mm-hmm. that's the only way to get Snakes 2. Um, this, this new album that we've got coming out called uh, Are You Awake? Uh, it smokes. It rips. It oh, is. Yeah. It is. It is snakes in the playground. You know, it's uh, it's just 30 years later. So right. you got you got an old dude singing, you know, you got just it's just normal, heavy rock riffs like Troy plays. It's mm-hmm. we're not we're not inventing the wheel. We're, we're we're actually just doing what we do. And 
your your voice is incredible even over the years you know you're talking about 30 years later and you're you're so strong i mean i, I guess you just take care of your voice i mean it's it's just amazing that i mean you can't the older you get your voice still sounds the same it sounds even better well my my uh my technique to singing is do not warm up because it wears out your voice before you sing uh only drink water uh that will go against every vocal teacher that's ever taught vocals, but I've never had a vocal lesson. So oh, wow. uh, it, it works for me. And I never wanted to learn to do something so properly that it took the rock out of it. Uh, I've seen people do rock music and, and do covers. Uh, there's a couple of people that come to mind and sometimes it's spot on. And then sometimes they're, they're so their technique and everything is so formatted. It's, it just looks so rehearsed rather than just being just, that roll, let it come out. I know where to pull my vocal from, whether it's my gut, my diaphragm, my throat, mm -hmm. swirl the words around in my mouth and spit them out with my tongue. You know, I, ju I just know what feels right. So that's what I do. I don't have to go, oh, well, this song, I need to get my head voice. That I don't even know what that's talking about. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> I just heard people talk about that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to hit you with some random a couple of random things that uh, that I'm thinking of. Um, the first one is speak into the machine. I had a speak in, into the machine T-shirt that I wore out and it had holes in it. Um, <laughs> will you ever bring that project back or is that a done thing? Uh, well, you know, I have been doing a lot of solo stuff. I did the speak into the machine. That was my first real solo thing, a very experimental acid rock. Just bizarre from one end up to the other, you know, and I did. um Another solo album I did was the, the Dale Thompson and the Religious Overtones and then Dale Thompson and the Kentucky Cadillacs. That was two blues albums. I did the oh, Acoustic yeah, yeah. Daylight. Mm -hmm. yeah, the Acoustic Daylight I did with Greg Martin of K Kentucky Headhunters. Uh, he played guitar on it and I sang. So it's just me and Greg in the studio. I taught him the songs and right there in the studio and he played them and, and we, we recorded live. So that that's called Acoustic uh, Daylight. I did, I did one called uh, Unbridled which I'm not real happy with. Uh, but anyway, it still it still got picked up and distributed. And then I started the band uh, Del Thompson and the Boondogs, and we're working on our third album. Oh, nice. And it, so all these projects you're doing, they're all available. Is it the Bride Hub? Is that, am I saying that right? I mean, I haven't been on there in a while. But is um, there one source you can get it from? Well, the best place to get it, because we have stopped selling our own albums, uh, we just, ha just haven't had time and to, to keep up, is uh, boonsoverstock.com. Uh, oh, yes. That's that's the best place to, to find it. Or if, if you go over to the Girder Music site, uh, they've got uh, the, uh, with, with Bride, they, they'll have some of the uh, special release albums and stuff, the cool vinyl the blue vinyl red vinyls and mm -hmm. you know remastered and stuff yeah your um is your is your new ep that you guys are putting out that that's on that's available on boons as well right or is that yeah just girder yeah no that yeah that's boons that that is something that matt uh matt hunt uh put together so is that limited edition this new ep is it like only a I, certain amount of i think it's things? sold out yeah i think it's already yeah. sold out it was a couple hundred 250 copies or something so if somebody got it they got something really rare so. well that's that that's good i mean you guys gonna release more or, or is that it i think that's it until the until the album comes out and i don't know what matt's marketing strategy is it's when we record now it's it's kind of like we go through the birthing process and we have the child and we just hand it to somebody and hope they raise it well and we never <laughs> see it again so it's just yeah you know and and the way that I'm I'm recording now is I don't have to learn the songs because uh, I'm not touring. So I honestly don't know any of the new material whatsoever. I just recorded it and off it goes. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, yeah. So I don't spend days rehearsing a song before I record it. When Troy sends me a song, hmm. I, I immediately open up my uh, uh, recording equipment and I start recording. And in two hours, I'm done with the song and send it back to him. Okay. So Where in, the, you, in the old days, it was weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you? Yeah, so are you, know, you, are you, you Are you? I'm sorry. Are you becoming uh, tech savvy? I mean, it sounds like you know what you're you're doing over I don't, there. I don't have a clue. <laughs> I do not have a clue. Matter of fact, this this microphone here, 
I've got two of these, and I've got a little um, audio box USB PreSonus, and all the vocals goes into there. And the only thing that I know to do to raise my vocals up and down is either get close to the mic or back up. <laughs> I'm about to say, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, it's like oh, that's kind of loud. I better back up another few inches, you know, that type of thing. So, are you guys? <laughs> so, you, you said you mentioned you're not touring. Are you not touring anymore at all, or is you retired from the played. stage? We haven't played a live show in about 12 years. Really? And um, if I get back to the States and we can work it out, Troy and I have talked about going out and, and playing shows, even if it's just Troy and I going out and playing like the people's favorite songs that they want to hear, you know, like everybody knows my name, would you die for me? Psychedelic super Jesus, some of those songs like that. And we just, and then we make it a storytelling oh, uh, nice. event. Yeah. yeah, some people, some people say I wouldn't come unless you played full blown, and I'm like, I'm glad I wouldn't be there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, if we play full blown, don't come. You know that's right. Of thing. Well, you know, <laughs> it's like <laughs> <laughs> I remember so, seeing you guys play acoustic in, in at Atlanta Fest. I want to say back in the day, um, Troy yeah. and I used to rip it up acoustically. I mean, he would he would beat the guitar like he was trying to, you know pray a grenade out from underneath of somebody to toss it away you know i mean he was he would brutalize his acoustic guitar and i would still do all the screaming and the the singing it just we just didn't have the drums and bass behind us so uh we we, we did feel a bit bit naked without without jerry and rick in those days you know yeah. if they if they weren't there uh you know that that was that was a good that was a good lineup of of bride it was absolutely that, that was a monster band that was the, I know that's not the original lineup, but to me, that's like the the classic lineup is you know Jerry uh, and Ricky and yeah. Troy and you guys. It's a shame, you know. I guess, I guess. Uh, do you ever uh, you know with Ricky Ricky passing right? He, that was yeah, the, Rick yeah. Rick had passed away a, a couple of years ago, uh, and I didn't even know he was sick. I didn't I didn't get word that he was sick until the day before he died. Uh, wow. So he he sort of kept it to himself. Uh, but he he had cancer and he he ended up passing away. Uh, Jerry is actually quite busy, quite active. Uh, he plays in a, a cover band called Rumors in the uh, Louisville, Southern Indiana area, and he's uh, some sort of assistant pastor at a, at a church somewhere. Oh, right now. oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, that'd be yeah, cool so if you guys yeah. did acoustic stuff and you had him play like some djembe or something, you know. Like, yeah, yeah. Troy's got a gym that he could use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, yeah that's that'd really be, cool. It'd be cool. Jer Jerry, uh, Jerry was always, uh, always the guy that we wanted behind the kit. You know, he was the guy that that we had most confidence in. And then this young kid named Michael Lloyd came along, who beat the drums like a beast. And Mike. Uh, we, we wanted to do the album. Mike learned the songs and he blasted onto the scene. He's the one that played on uh, This Is It. And, oh, uh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. And um, he played whatever came after that. He played an album that came over after that. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think Michael Lloyd played more live shows than Jerry did. Really? Uh, yeah. And most people don't remember that. But Mike's, Mike's got a band and I can't remember it now. He's He's got a Christian band. Uh, they're more uh, contemporary rock type band, but mm -hmm. man, they're really, really good. If I, I don't, I mean, you can find Mike on Facebook, but I forget the name of the band. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, and I don't yeah. know why I'm plugging him. Mike won't write me back anymore. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. Uh, I got a yeah. couple more little props here I was wanting to show you. Um, All right. you talk about being on uh, magazine covers, Heaven's Metal. Do you ever miss oh, yeah. these days? I, I do miss those days. Really? It, you know, it's, you know, for me, it wasn't even an ego boost uh, to yeah. be on the cover of a magazine. It was more like it validated the status in my mind that we were still relevant to some degree. So right. I was just, I was always worrying that, you know, this is it guys, probably one more year and we're done. And here it is 40 years and we're still going. So that's yeah. pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> It's pretty cool to show your parents too. Like, look, I'm on a magazine cover, you know? Like, oh yeah. The yeah. Flex and, we, a and we, and Troy and I have always had a uh, great, uh, great uh, connection with our parents who, who have supported us from the beginning. Even when we didn't know what we were doing, we made them think we knew what we were doing. So they wouldn't worry. So. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Did, 
Does anyone in your family, like you, you and Troy, do you guys collect bride stuff from the past? Or you got, I mean, is your family, or do you have, or do you just don't, you're not a big collector? I think Troy keeps one of everything that we do, at least maybe two. I've got, I've got a partial bit, but it's just basically to make sure that I don't forget what I've done. Uh, <laughs> I've got like, I've got a silence is madness on the wall. Here is your God on the wall. I've got, I got a bunch of live to die and stuff that they sent me over here and show no mercy albums that they sent from a uh, girder. Uh, but they're all still in the boxes. So, yeah. uh, yeah, I, I mean, I uh, I don't have a big collection of anything. The only thing I have a collection of is things that, that the record companies would send me too much of. Oh, like, okay. I'm in bloody New Zealand, so you send me 50 CDs. What am I going to do with 50 CDs in New Zealand? <laughs> there's there's only six bride fans in the whole country, so uh, <laughs> it costs too much to mail them out. So those are going to be – those are going to go to homeless people or something. I don't know. I'll hand them out sooner or later. So here, I want an album. I don't have a dollar, but you know, you, know, so. you should just give them to your kids on Christmas. You know, I'm sure they'll, they'd appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know if my kids listen to what I do. Yeah, I do they? Ask, that's so. a that's a good question. Well, my my oldest two sons, Alex and Zachary, uh, are known to be musicians. So so they do listen, and I send stuff to my youngest son, uh, Jordan, and he'll comment and say, "Hey, that's pretty cool, Dad," or you know. Uh, but he, but Jordan's not making making music. Uh, but Jordan's actually, all three of them can sing really well. But they've got other interests. I guess they've oh, seen yeah. the road that I've gone down, and they're like, ah, I don't <laughs> want to go down that road, boy. That you never get out of there. It's a rabbit hole, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Does your wife yeah. listen to Bride? Does she, is she a Bride fan or any any of your projects? That's that's a crazy thing because um, I moved here to get married. Right, I got to take a leg brace off real quick. Oh yeah. Oh. Uh, I got a torn meniscus in my knee right now. So I put that on, I lose circulation. But uh, no, it's a weird thing because uh, we just had our ninth uh, year uh, wedding anniversary a few days ago. Oh, and, Yeah, thank you. And the, and, the reason, and the reason that we're even together is because I was single and she was single at the time. Uh, you know, both had had another life before the life we were living. And um it was on New Year's Eve. Uh, must have been 2013, maybe. I think. Uh, I'm guessing at some dates, but anyway. And uh, I, I was up late, you know, by myself, talking to fans on the computer like I do. And uh, it's when they used to have that poke button. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Facebook. yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember so, that. Uh, I, I, saw, I saw a picture. Yeah. Uh, MySpace or Facebook? One of those, yeah. 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 So anyway, I poked her or whatever, just to say, hey, what's going on? You know, hope you're having a, I didn't even know who she was. I just saw, there's a very pretty blonde. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll just make some contact here. I'd, I'd already probably talked to, you know, five or 10 people and, uh, you know, I was winding down for the night and everything. And uh, then I get a poke back and I'm like, oh, I'm like, hey, how are you? Where, you know, where are you from? Uh, I live in New Zealand. I'm like, well, that's, that's over quick, you know, that, that ain't going to work. And, uh, so we, we started talking and, um, we Skype dated for several months. And then, um, I said, well, I said, why don't I come out to New Zealand and see you? I said, you know, we can, we can tour around the country. You can show me the country and stuff. And as I've never been to New Zealand, I've been other places, but never there. She said, Oh yeah. Yeah. So she took her holiday and, um, I came here and we toured around the North Island and uh, decided that, yeah, I think probably should get married. Wow. And so yeah. I went back to the, to the U.S. not knowing what all it would entail. I did have to get a tourist visa to come, so I knew how difficult it was to get a tourist visa. So then I had to get another type of visa. But uh, she said she honestly didn't think I was coming back. She just figured once I left, that was it, you know, and back yeah. back to normal life and uh then i started telling her uh you need to be looking for an engagement ring she's like what i'm like yeah, yeah you need to find yourself an engagement ring I, you know i've got three cars and i just sold one of them so I'm, I'm getting some money together and stuff to come back and then um end up selling my house got rid of the cars found homes for my dogs uh all that stuff and uh came here and in uh, 2014 uh we got married so 
and to find out she had my albums. Oh, she did. Yeah. yeah I, I wasn't her favorite band, but she had my albums. So. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. yeah that, that's a huge step, man. <laughs> Selling all your stuff and, and, and moving like that. That's it's, it's pretty big. insane. I've no, I've, I mean, it's I've not all, insane. It's just big. I've always been, been a risk taker. You know, I've, I've always, if, if my gut says to do it, I just do it. I, I don't have any, any fear. My, my biggest fear of anything in this life is, is, um, probably not having fear. So, I mean, I'll tackle anything, you know, you know, I box for 20 something years. So you learn that you can't let fear be a, be a factor. If you, you have to keep your mind on what you're doing, you know, right. You can't think of failure. You have to think, you know, I'm going to overcome whatever's in front of me. And, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, I guess if I was standing on the edge of a building somewhere, I might be a bit, bit frightful, but, I don't think the word fear is exactly the right word. So, wow, man, that's that's crazy, man. I fear so many things. <laughs> do, do you ever do you ever do any dangerous stuff like skydiving? I mean, do you ever fear I've, about that kind of stuff? I have skydived before. Uh, um, that that was that was way cool. Uh, I didn't get as much out of it as people get out of it, though, because uh, I really didn't know what to expect. I, I was someplace, and Troy pulled up in the drive, and it's a convertible Mustang. He's got a nice classic convertible Mustang. And this was years ago. And this was right before Drop, uh, the album Drop. And he pulls yeah. up and he goes, hey, I want to go skydiving. You want to go? I'm like, okay. Wow. So yeah. jumped in the car and <laughs> just like that. Off we went and paid 150 bucks and went up and jumped out tandem. And so that was that was quite cool. Troy's That's Troy cool. actually loved it so much that. And he's he bought two airplanes and he's become a pilot. So oh, that's that's crazy. I need to interview that guy. I think I got to interview Troy sometime, man. That's cool. Troy, you got to ask Troy the right questions, though. You you got to Troy. Ha, Troy is a uh, enigma. He uh, is he. Unless you ask him, you're not. In, he's not going to reveal anything. I'll I'll tell you anything, even if you don't ask. Oh, no. but Troy, but Troy's different. You know, he's Troy. Uh, it's not like he's got anything hiding in the closet, but he's got a lot of things going on that you just wouldn't think of. So, <laughs> is he your older brother or younger brother? Uh, he's younger than me, but two years and so many months. Okay, yeah, yeah. But I got the I got the looks, so that's that's what is the good part out of. He got <laughs> the brains, I got the good looks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, that's that's awesome. It, it, well, Dale, man, I really appreciate you uh, being on the show. This means a lot to me. You know, hey, I, I, I grew up. I appreciate to you. it. If if somebody didn't show interest, then it would be it would be a bit of a of a drab thing, you know, to to think that you've completely been forgotten. You no, know? So, no, and and it's and it's funny because when you asked me about doing this, yeah, I had just posted uh, a video and I had said uh, I'm not doing any more interviews oh, with right. anybody for any reason. If you want to talk to somebody, talk to my brother. <laughs> and I posted that the next day. You wrote and you said. Uh, would you like to do an interview? <laughs> I was like, well, that guy's gutsy, man. I just said. I, I didn't said, even did know he, he said did, that. That's funny. Yeah, I was like, did he just see me post that? And he's like, yeah, I'll get you on the show. <laughs> oh, no, man. I'm not gutsy. That, that's funny. I had no idea. You, you, that's hilarious. You did an interview uh, with my buddy Joel from Imaginary Music. That was that was cool that oh, you were on yeah. there. Yeah. You know what? He, he, he's, he was so kicked back and laid back. He And I didn't know him. I, I, you know, I know people by their pictures, right, on Facebook. Right. And if you ever change your picture on Facebook, I think you're a new person. I, I can't. I just don't. If the if it changes, I'm like, okay, I don't. I don't know who that is. But uh, yeah, but yeah, I knew his. I knew his face because he's had that picture up for a while. And yeah, I was like, yeah, that's that's real cool. I'm glad, I'm glad he got a hold of me on that. Yeah, and so and also, uh, I'm buddies with Jericho, Chris Jericho, and you got to be on his show, man, because he, he loves. Uh, do you know how to get a hold of Jericho? Yeah. Yeah, I'll reach out because to him. Because Jericho and I were really good friends years ago. Uh, he approached me. Uh, he contacted me on Facebook or MySpace or something and said, uh, hey, you might not know who I am, but my name is Chris Irvine. I wrestle on the WWF or WWE, whatever it was. And he said, I just want to let you know I love what you're doing. I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm a huge fan. So I'm like, okay, for real, who are you? And why would you think that I believe that you're the real Chris Jericho? And he wrote, writes back and he goes, 
why why would I think you're the real Dale Thompson? And I <laughs> said, right. I said, okay, here's my phone number. Call me. So <laughs> phone rings. It's Chris. Hello. Hey, Chris Jericho here. I'm like, get out of here, man. That's like so so That's Chris awesome. came. Chris came to Louisville and we went to church uh, together. Oh, cool. We had pizza together. Uh, he came another time and we were backstage and stuff. And then Fozzie came through and, yeah. and, you know, hanging out with him on the tour bus and stuff. But after this is over, send me Chris's info because I've just, I've moved. I've, I've left the planet basically. And I've lost contact with him. I mean, not just that I want to be on a show, but I just want to say hi to him and let him know that, you know, it wasn't like I had, forsaken our friendship so yeah man uh, absolutely yeah that's, that's yeah. cool i didn't know yeah, all that. i didn't know you guys went to church together and ate pizza that's awesome man <laughs> yeah my mom my mom who is actually a black belt in taekwondo demonstrated oh, cool. a karate chop to chris while he was eating pizza at pizza <laughs> hut and uh she almost came too close with the chop to the throat oh, i was really? like mom please and chris was like Whoa, feisty <laughs> little woman. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's nuts. <laughs> All right, Dan. Well, I appreciate it again, man. Being on the show, this means the world to me. So thank you All so right, much. Yeah. Thank you. And and let me let me know. Uh are you are you do you post this somewhere? Yes, yeah, so I'll so I'll post it on um YouTube and then I'm part of a classic metal show network, the CMS network, and that it'll be posted on, on that side as well. Uh, it'll probably be posted in a few weeks. Yeah, maybe. Oh, two I, weeks. yeah, just yeah. Uh, hit hit me up and, and and send me a tag on it or something. So Absolutely, I'll, I'll promote it. Yeah, yeah. All right, hey, appreciate it a whole lot. You take care of yourself. You too, Dell. Let's keep in touch, man. I'll I'll let you know All about right. Chris or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Let me know. Let me know. Appreciate that. Thank you. Hey, take care, Dell. Thank you. God bless. You too, man.